Mary is is not. I did it. Yeah, great. Oh, thanks, Mary. Yeah. So good afternoon, everyone. Again, For those of you who may not know me, my name is Maria Luisa Arroyo. Oh, forgive me. And I'm a new advisory board member of the New England Poetry Club. Today, I will serve as your host. Um, please put your, your mics on muted. And also, if you do not want to have your face featured as part of the video, you may also blank out the video as well to respect your, your privacy and your comfort level. All right. Um, open mic will be after the main reading. And there'll be one page, one poem, 12 readers. Um, and Linda will host the open mic. Today's readers are Howie Howie Feierstein, Stephen Honig, and Ken Lee. And as, as you look into the chat, they did share their publication information. And this information is also available on our website. We hope you'll join us again next month, December 13th, when our readers will be Glenn Curie, Moria Linehan, and Jose Edmundo Reyes. Once we begin, you will be muted. We will invite you to unmute yourself briefly after the three readers have finished so that we may clap and for a Q&A and again at the end of the open mic. We will have breakout rooms for those who like to stay after the open mic. So Howie, may I please have you unmute yourself. I'm going to introduce you. Howie Feierstein is the author of two full length collections, Dreaming of the Rain in Brooklyn and Gugut's and Other Poems, both published by Press 53. A new chapbook, Out of Order, will be published by Main Street Rag in early 2021. A five-time Pushcart nominee, his poems and reviews can be found in numerous journals, including Great River Review, Nimrod, Cutthroat, Off the Coast, Rattle, Upstreet, Mudfish, and online in Verse Daily, Nix's Mate, Peacock Journal, and Connotation. He presently volunteers as a citizen mentor at the Center for New Americans, is co-poetry editor of Cutthroat, a journal of the arts, a reader for Perugia Press, and you can correct me on that, forgive me for not asking earlier, and Nagatuck River Review. He lives in Florence, Massachusetts. Please welcome Howie Feierstein. Thank you, Maria. Okay. So I'm going to read uh, from the two full lengths and from the new chapbook and maybe something else, something newer. I'm going to start with a poem uh, I think is a good poem to start with today. Uh, it was written two years ago. Things are different now. And it's called Let This Knuckle of Raisin Chala Last. Let hectoring crows quarrel over the slow-footed possum dead in the road, and let the cat's heartbeat supplant the tick-tock of this hour. Let storm door replace screen and white light replace yellow for the warm season moths are now dead, and let there be patience and wood enough as November begins its bleed through the crevices of this house. Let Dove's vulnerability triumph as Merlin thrusts through sudden dusk. Let no disturbance hinder ground bees tunneling the tattered garden. Let sparrows follow swifts and a wailing tenor ruffle the hog farm's cornfield. Let this pot-bound clivia match the growth of summer pokeweed. And let the suck and sell of threadbare tyrants dissolve. Let all contradictions be made public and all talk of God emanate from those unaffiliated rather than crypto fascist hypocrites. Let the treaties be finally honored and the American Klansman return to his cave. Let strangler fig and corkscrewing creeper be uprooted. Let my grandmother close her eyes even as Cossacks force them open as they slaughter her daughter than husband. Let yellowing of rows of Sharon and samba of twisting leaves signal regeneration, then redemption. Allow this miasma of, to finally lift before our perfect moon flees to another sun. And let there be a commingling of language and let the whole in all its movable parts spin 
on the autumn carousel, a whirl on town common. So that one is in Out of Order, the new chapbook, and this one is also, it's called Monarch. Anchored to a spent daisy in the forge of continuous summer, an orange and black speckled butterfly had spun her silk pad, had shed caterpillar skin, had burst capsuled chrysalis, and I named her Whitman and water and wind, her forelegs vestigial held close to her body, and I named her fish and sparrow, and when she lifted with a sound of light rain, she flew beyond milkweed stalks, above a caution sign and grooved pavement, unbent, unbridled, and I named her otter and fire, and when she rose among asters and comets, luminous, when she stroked through cloudless blue, unclosed, unbidden, I named her unmechanical. Now I call her mist and dawn. I looked knowing her gone, a pool of blue shade in her place. Next poem will be from the first chapbook, the first book, uh, Dreaming of the Rain in Brooklyn. And it's called In the Narrows. We sifted the contents of one plastic bag into another, saving some of her for our missing brother. Then we spilled her ashes into the sea, into the atmosphere, onto our shoes, and then we ate of her. We fed our mother to the eels and crabs and mermaids lurking behind the rocks along shore road, across from the traffic of the highway. We fed our mother to the tidal strait, linking upper and lower New York Bay. Her ashes spilled into the shallows, clumping into the wholeness she lacked. Black-headed gulls with darkened wingtips shrieking above her form. Coming together after seven years, we fed our mother's ashes to the wind, blowing five feet above the deep, while we leaned on the railing of the pier, watching waves carrying out to sea, widening, then compressing, returning her to Odessa. We emptied mother out of a plastic bag, only a name left, her journey just beginning. But I see her as her, my children will see me when I am powder mixed with earth. And as she prayed each Sabbath to three candle flames, for she was her father's daughter, haltingly we recited the mourner's cottage, and then we ate of her, for we are our mother's sons. Change the mood a little bit, uh, read a poem from Gagoots and other poems. This one is called, You Ask Me How I Describe You to my friends, a love poem. I tell of a man jailed for the fifth time because of his fear of liberty. And I say, because of my fear of life without you, I could be arrested too. But that's about me. And so I say, it's also true that I can't describe you because I've used up my allotment of consonants and vowels, except for double U's and since we've met, it's been a whirlwind and I'm windblown and wayward. Sometimes I tell them you reflect the shine juncos drop on shadows of falling snow. Or I say that waking up, speechless Harpo is in my bed, blonde hair like on the curly kale uncovered in March thaw. Then I tell them you're like pigeons on a peak roof or wasps in winter or gulls blown inland maneuvering between our laughs, their cries, circling ghost-like over St. Mary's Cemetery, a matted ocean of grassy graves where a violet blends into orange. I never say you're my main squeeze, G, F, lover, old lady. I say you're more like a mackerel than a flounder since you've got those pretty eyes on both sides of your burnished face. I've even admitted to feeling like the Subaru when it kicked into gear on its own, taking every zigzag of the driveway until smashing backward into an oak 
That's how much the wagon craved love, broken glass, crunched trunk, the mud. And so I add, you remind me of the old men gathered in storefront shuls, reciting the blessing for the new moon of Tishrei, and how Coltrane played a different solo each night at the Vanguard when the quartet laid down my favorite things. And one final thing, I confess, you make me think of Daddy Wags, Cleveland Indians left fielder, I thought had the highest and sweetest cheekbones until I met you. Moving right along. And again, a big change in mood. Uh, this is a recent poem, uh, not in any, maybe it'll be in the next book, whenever that'll be. It's called Eight Minutes and 46 Seconds. In the first 60 seconds, I kept watch on the towering sugar maple. I counted limbs growing from its trunk and limbs growing from those limbs. I tallied 10. Then there were all the side branches to add. Night air outside the open window was cool with a subtle blue breeze. In that second minute, twilight showed the contrasting buff and black of a bobolink's head. I wondered how much bend was left in the bow, how it reached toward the risen moon, how it stretched beyond the roof. In the third minute, I saw palm-shaped leaves lengthening, aphids scaling veins. I wondered how much rot infested the bowl if carpenter ants tunneled through the stems. There was a quickening in the fourth minute. Early May fireflies lit up the street and the multi-lobed leaves began to breathe. The sound was deafening. In the fifth minute, a garter snake coiled around the tree's base, then slithered through a thicket of saplings. I saw it flick its forked, black-tipped red tongue. I saw it retract it. In the sixth minute, a sapsucker began its rhythmic drumming. Loosened bark dropped to the grass. Scolding house wrens rattled when a red-tailed shadow passed over. In the seventh minute, a spider was taken by a sparrow. Wind came up and the maple's dense crown waved like cornstalks. Patches of blue sky slipped like ice through the night. Then the eighth minute, when there were no longer any minutes, not the minute before or the second after, not the first spring migrant, not the last blooming aster. Suffocation, nothing o'clock. For eight minutes and 46 seconds, we watched a man cuffed and pinned to the pavement, repeating over and over, I can't breathe. We heard his call for his mama, the full weight of a cop on his neck, the man's breath extinguished. Next poem, Changing the Mood. From Gagoots, it's called Provincetown. There were mulberry limbs twined with mimosa branches leaning close to the back door. Stretching, I could barely reach the fruit hanging high above a narrow path. Mulberries for breakfast, mulberries with lunch, our teeth stained that whole week. Each of us believed the other was dreaming. Imagination wasn't necessary. Late afternoons, we took the small crooked side streets leading to the harbor, passing scrolled awnings and furled flags, porches intaglioed by purple morning glories, a raft of eider ducks with their black bellies and white backs visible from the bleached wharf. It was July 4th, nearing dusk, when we joined the promenade up Commercial Street. Couples arm in arm, men with men, women with women, women with men, the smell of mud at low tide. A street musician playing a Bach suite on her viola, an elegantly dressed woman singing from Carmen in faulty French. Down one clamshell alleyway, I thought I heard a Bob White's whistled call perhaps answering those first explosions. Long Point Light and Pilgrim Monument always in the distance. The mast of the schooner Rose Dorothea threatening to rise through the library steeple. And at every open space between crowded shops at every corner, 
fireworks erupting, the children's moon at first quarter as the sun dropped lower, already the days beginning to shorten. Once we reached the West End breakwater, we forgot everything. That's what we told each other. Imagination wasn't necessary, each of us believing the other was dreaming. Then we swung round and strolled back, stopping in a painter's studio where a show was being hung. The artist said, I don't want to know what I'm painting but every move she'd made had intention. Every step we took, the bleeding berries, Bob White calling its mate, light tumbling off rung constellations, each star in the ladder tipping over, spilling song, filling the darkness that finally stretches over land's end, the bursting flame over half the world. And here's a short poem called My New House. I wrote this when I was living in uh, Colorado. My New House. The Ute who lived here before us stuck a salt lick behind a stump, kept his quiver on the kitchen counter, killed deer through the window. When neighbors noticed his wife was gone and the stench of rotting flesh grew stronger, the sheriff came and dismantled the shed, found the carcass of a half-butchered buck. These first weeks a doe bounds down the ridge. Sometimes she sleeps in front of the propane tank. She won't leave when I shout. Okay, this one is gonna be in the new chapbook, Out of Order, which they're taking advanced sales on right now. It's called No One Ever Said. It's a small world I inhabit, but it's unfair to say I spent two months inside a funicula. I'm a man. I shift huge beetles to the side of the drive, but can't protect the wasp, the calendula, the lettuce from frost, so much for consolation. It's exciting to walking into town after living so long without sidewalks, but like a greenhorn, I gave too much to one man, took too little from another, so much for compensation. No one ever said I chased the sun from Rome to Cairo, that I showed deference to my elders, that I see more a swallow than a shoe bill. Does it matter where I'm from, where I've been, where I'm heading? No one ever said I could play the clarinet or warble like a thrush, no matter the ancient maple dropping another clump, no matter a dozen groaning white pines bow lower to the ground. I've been lucky traveling along the scarified surface of two bloodied centuries. I stand constant with our daily revolutions. So much for civilization. Still, mystery proliferates. Why was the yearling here trashing a bag of leaves at so late an hour? And why did that bear put in mind a gray afternoon in Leadville when a coyote lured our husky into the maw of its pack? The dog saved finally through my own trickery. I think of that pup these first icy days, how I cherished her, and I consider all the choices I've made since she died. Was it easy? Was it hard? No one ever asked. Okay, we have a three poem warning. Uh, this one is... Uh, in the other book. Uh, I don't know how many of you watch birds, but this poem is about a uh, sparrow, mig a migrant, that showed up today in my backyard for the first time this fall, fox sparrow. It's called to the wary fox sparrow rustling in the leaf litter. I have never given up on you, your sporadic visitations, Live on through the present extinction. Never ab abandon me, no matter my home. Visit me in the third month of the year of my death. Visit me again in the 11th month. Always signal the end of winter as you mark 
its beginning. And this one is for my daughter. It's called Brando, her godfather. Conceived on the night we saw last tango in Paris. She's always been my child, that much I'm sure of. I was so much larger then, could hold her fullness against my chest, lying there in the sunken living room. My legs pulled up, sweet jack-in-the-box, perched on my knees, a pyramid, a slide, and when I splayed them open, she tumbled down. I was roller coaster, rocking chair, slingshot, catapult. She was counterweight, payload, cannonball, curled tongue snaking out her mouth, resting on lower lip. Joyous she was, over and over, hilarious. Again, again, love was that easy. And then the last poem for the reading today. And I just want to say congratulations to America for what happened this week. This is a poem called Bricolage. Because of a chiromancer's prophecy in the stippled surface of time, because I am slack-jawed, monogamous, a survivor of five o'clock fever, because I knowingly confessed I take fiction on faith, not on account of or by reason why, not for the reason that, only because, because reality strikes us 150 frames per second, because the fuzzy pot of milkweed remains upright in the storm and fireflies cast the yard into a frenzied field of flight. Because there were so many tangles I stumbled through to get here. For instance, my love line that a Texarkana palm reader gently traced in three separate directions. Because gnats whirl in a faint breeze as geese shoot for the lake. Because cast off elders live in their cars and box elder bugs copulate backwards as inchworms dangle then loop. There are a hundred ways to arrive at the same place in this town, and still it's possible to get lost, which is true of many things. Because there's a model penis in a jaw filled with alcohol in a Mississippi courthouse, because the flag tacked to the door is painted in ignorance, because memory's a sinkhole opening at the back of one's throat, because what is remembered is surrendered and the pension's death benefit is irrevocable, because repetition is unavoidable and failure inconceivable, because war is continual and life ends so quickly. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Are we allowed to uh, uh, converse or ask a question or? Oh, oh, thank you for that clarifying question. What we're going to do is keep the questions for after the, re the three readings. So what I've been doing is I, I tend to scribe my, my questions, for each poet, so that when we come to the Q&A, we can add them then. Very good. Thank you. All right. So I have the joy of introducing um, Steve Honig. He is a practicing corporate attorney living in Newton. And it says here in two days, you'll be 78. Is that correct? Or have you already had a birthday? Two days. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, I think. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Congratulations. So Steve has been writing poetry and prose for about 70 of those years. A collection of his earlier works entitled Messing Around with Words and his 2019 chapbook entitled Railhead are available at Amazon. Steve presently is editing another volume of poetry from which he will read today in a chapbook inevitably concerning our favorite pandemic. As soon as his editor is done with his scissors, Steve will publish a book of short stories entitled Noir Ain't the Half of It based on the underbelly of his native New York City. He wants you to know that whatever modest credit is due to him belongs to his mother, who made him memorize the poem Evangeline when he was 10. 
all 50 pages of it. Please welcome Steve. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, let's start with something uh, light and seasonal and we can uh, take it downhill from there. This poem is called Apples. Do make slick the shining skin as I twist, don't pull, and feel at last the quiet snap that puts the apple in my hand. My mouth, it's so grand, so sweet, I eat them all, standing there midst row on row of drooping trees, their branches grazing the buzzing earth with squishing, squashing, stepped upon, falling, fallen, green and yellow and red, and speckled and wormy bird pecked simply dropped apples, would-be ciders soft and hard, pies sweet and tart, the mother of all good things of fall now underfoot and humming with flies and bees, snacking on sugar and yellowing meat. We taste of each as we make our way, bag bursting, dropping newest treasures to the ground, which ones are for cooking, which for sauce, which to eat. Spread on the hillside is the orchard in the heart of Massachusetts to which each September we find our way to drink cider with hot donuts and sugar, the harvest app and harvest apples carrying still their wounds of original sin. Oh, Cortland's, oh, Max, oh, odd name, McCoon's, oh, green Granny Smith's, oh, greener green Crispin's all the way from Japan. Yes, Brayburn's, yes, Gala's in wild celebration. Delicious, delicious, both dark red and golden as butter. My stomach screams stop, but the mind overpowers and crunching and sucking while homeward driving, the perfume of apples fills both lungs and nostrils. Back home, trouser bottoms soaked wet and still clinging to stockings and shins with small leaves still hanging, we pile up our apples, forgetting their species and declare that the fall is our most favored season. This next poem is called Holding Hands. It sounds like it was written in contemplation of the pandemic. It was written uh, uh, before that, uh, but perhaps regrettably too apt today. Holding Hands. I am holding your hand. You may not feel it, see it, even know it, but your hand and mine are entwined. I am holding his hand. He may not feel it, see it, even know it, but his hand and mine are entwined. I am holding her hand. She may not feel it, see it, even know it, but her hand and mine are entwined. I am holding all their hands. They surely do not feel it, see it, even know it, but their hands and mine are entwined. We are in this together, although we do not understand the this. Sprightly, we know we all must pull together if we are going to survive all of this. Brightly, we know that tomorrow we can be better if we all go together through this. So forward then lightly as we hold each other's hands. Ah, well and good, I said to myself, and then things began to go south. I tingled my fingers in search of you, of him, of her, of them. For a while, long time it seemed, and I did not feel it, see it, began to doubt it. When I again felt fingers, pulled at palms, dug nails into flesh and was renewed, tears dropped on my cheeks, and I shook with promise, reached up to wipe my tears because I, you, he, her, they were all saved, all entwined. Then I looked down, and I was only holding my own clasped hands. Going from dark to darker, perhaps, this poem is called Killer. He was a cook with an AK-47 and big plans. He was a student in a dorm room chosen because its state had lax gun laws. She was a mother who blew away her children and herself. He hated schools, or was it children, or was it his friends? He sniped two teens who wandered on his property. He shot up a nightclub, he shot up a street. He shot at random and killed a teenager of promise. He shot at random and killed a little girl whose promise was yet to come. He killed for his gang, he killed for his pride, he killed for his family, he killed because of the voice of his cat, although his dog told him not to do it. He killed in war and it became a habit. He killed because he was fired, he killed because he was not hired, he killed because he was not promoted. He killed her with a knife while she walked someone's dog, the ink on her new master's degree still wet in her pocket. He killed because everyone needs a hobby. He killed because of his race, he killed for his art, he killed for his president, he killed for his religion, he killed because she wore a scarf, he killed because they wore skull caps, he killed because it was an initiation, he killed because of their color, he killed because they were gay, he, he killed because he wanted their sneakers. He killed because he was off his meds, 
He killed because he wanted to die. He killed because he was high. He killed because he was depressed. He killed because he was nuts at the moment. He killed because God made him do it. He killed because speed made him do it. He killed because he was allergic to coffee, if it had caffeine. His dad taught him to shoot. And when his dad hit him, his dad had it coming. He slept with my girl. He slept with my wife. She slept with my teammates. They were going to deport me. They were going to deport my kids. I don't need no goddamn reason to kill him. What's it to you? Certainly in need of a change of pace, this poem is called Laertes in America. Laertes, we may recall, is the father of Odysseus and also the brother of Ophelia. Laertes took a stroll through America. Every time he thought he had found a son, he ended up alone with a long road to hoe. He lacked foresight of his future and then succumbed too soon for it to matter. There was not much familiar for Laertes, Laertes uh, on his odyssey, but of a sudden, Certain things rang true. Chaos and pain and confusion set on a disquieted stage where the script was ad-libbed and people died with regularity. A poison sword tip wavers over us. You also know that such poisons that go around come around. No Refund is a poem about love gone awry. I have a disquieting ennui. You are antisocial. I am irritated by major events. You are allergic to all of life. I am forthcoming in matters of the heart. You are closed. I play well with others. You play with others. I am raising my child with concern for the outcome. You are raising your child with an outcome of concern. People stand when I enter the room. People cannot stand it when you enter a room. I think sex is wonderful, you think sex is war. I think love is encompassing, you don't think of love as anything. All I'm left with is this disquieting ennui. Next, a poem for those times when perhaps you're not happy being who you are, called, Who Do I Want to Be Today? Did you ever dream who you would be if you could be anybody? Oh, not a specific person, those jobs are taken. Just the person being you, filling some role, then basking in some direct or reflected glory, giving yourself the glow that is missing from your life. At my desk over coffee, I imagined a list of today's new roles for me. I am sitting at a window table in a cafe, drizzle in the city street in a woman's coat, fur collar, holding a copy of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's poetry, one long stemmed rose between the pages, bloom showing out. Banal, says a voice. Perhaps, but it is so beautiful, I reply. I am a body double in Hollywood. My recent jump off the fourth floor into a swimming pool caught the camera and the eye of the famous star who has taken off her shirt, revealing sharp tan lines. Washington turns to me and asks if the timing is right to cross the river. The fires of Trenton shimmer across the flat, half-frozen surface of the water. Leonard Bernstein shakes my hand. I hastily transfer my bow into my left palm, being careful not to scratch my violin. The Martian ice cap crunches beneath my boot. I cannot hear the sound. My seventh grade French teacher is 12, holding the barbed wire. I cut the wire in the nighttime and she places her hand in mine and steps into the darkness. The blue numbers on her forearm can no longer be seen. Willie Nelson leans toward me and tells me it's been a pleasure to be on the same stage with me. The whiskey on his breath is strong, but I do not turn away. God asks, how's she doing? I struggle to answer as the examination is graded pass fail. My mother tells me again that she loves me. The dirt has not penetrated her pine box. Now direly in need of a change of pace, this poem is called Wolf, dedicated to the three little pins. Doors implode, thatch and wood fly, roofs rise to shade the sun, and finally bricks unmoored from mortar shoot lethal arrows, foreboding etched on every snout, saliva drips from every pointy mouth. I, destroyer of hubris, bringer of truth, begin. Ham and hocks and ribs and bacon and chitlins and sinews and brains and lungs and knuckles and bristles descend into gullet with a curled tail chaser. The moral of this fairy tale is, please pick one. A boy scout is always prepared, but the porcine troop forgot the message. 
never jest at the dawn with death. The road less taken leads to a jurisdiction with more robust building codes. None of the above. Morals are a false construct. Next, a story of a depressed man with reason. His life hung as a gray shroud around his shoulders, stooping him under its weight, although the cloth itself was thin as gauze. The pinch of skin in his neck showed pink, but his face was as gray as his garment, suggesting that blood was pumping from nether parts, but dared not reach his face to see and hear his fate. His muse had explained it all to him in terms so simple as to deny escape, no exegesis to confuse, no epiphany to excuse. Legs propelled him straight, steady though with lurch, along a road insanely curved. Guided by instincts he did not have, no wonder he was treading in muddy dishes. He had been born to promise, no less a seer than his own mother had proclaimed. He had been educated by the best of them. They just were not good enough, it seems. He tried to turn around but could not. Seems he was always al already headed that way. Something shorter, uh, sonnet, 14 lines, a sonnet for Terence Hayes. You are black like I am Jewish, only different. Different pains and different perceptions of pain. Where one stands is the only unmovable point. We both get lost in the rhythm of words. We both get lost in the injuries of life. You box your pain in 14 lines. Is it to make it yield to analysis? Is it to seek your catharsis? Or is it to control your own pain as if more than 14 lines hurt too much? My pain would need four pages, but I will limit myself here to 14 lines, just this once. Love takes a ride. Love leaves by the front door, riding on one harsh word too many that cannot be retrieved. Love leaves by the back door, pulled by unrequited desires that need to be bound in mystery. Love leaves up a chimney, incinerated by too much fire, the hearth consuming all the home. Love leaves through an open window, a careless error, encountering a wandering heart. Love is a random wanderer by bus or car, or by train or by train of thought, without known destination. But love can wander far and never find its way back and then can be said to, be, to have been lost. Love itself is silent and keeps in motion in unrequited quest for a new home. When you find a love on offer, you must ask yourself, is it newborn or is it merely on the road? And speaking of roads brings us to a poem for Hunter Thompson. Hunter bought the ticket. He hung by the ultimate thread, hands bloodied as the wire of his life cut his skin and flesh to the bone and then passed on through, rendering him particles unwhole, unwholesome and random in the eye of a mind he no longer controlled. Corkscrews reamed and, dra reamed and drained him, even as their torque excited him, as the wine drained into a glass with no bottom. His ticket was punched twice when only one fare was due and the price too high to start with. His father once told him, when on the wrong side of the grass, there will be no answer to your question. Next to last poem, I write a reasonable amount of stuff in rhyme. Uh, I've spared you most of it, but let's try this one. It's called Lickety Split. Lickety Split, Lickety Split, sliding down the edge of tomorrow. Don't like this feeling one damn bit. Feels like the promise of sorrow. Ever find yourself in a very bad place even though you're living straight arrow? Ever feel low when they throw it in your face while you're trying for the clean and narrow? They always tell you that life's like that, so do your best to do good. Don't dirty yourself doing tit for tat. Just always behave like you should. As for me, I'm feeling fine. No moss on this rolling stone. Do the job toe the line, work yourself down to the bone. Somehow though, darkness follows me, evil sneaks into my head, not the way that I want it to be, but see, it's just like I said. Sooner or later you can go astray, drooling in another man's beer, and you pay the price that very day and afterwards live with your fear. I still keep trying to do my bit, never beg, steal, or borrow, but lickety split, lickety split, I'm sliding down the edge of tomorrow.
My last poem is about our mutual needs for absolution. It is called Absolved. <clears throat> I am absolved, absolved I tell you, not full born from the head of Zeus, but mind you close enough. Comes the sun whispering of summer, promising cleansing heat by sweat and travails unending. But that is the false part of the promise for everything ends. So make the best of what you have, of what is promised by glance and sound. The birds in song, the sprouts in green, the different winds stirring buds and shoots, the tomorrow warmer still as if in confirmation. And by these things I am absolved as promised by my God of all bonds I have made to that God in foolish haste, in quaking fear, even yes, in fervent belief. And I am absolved, absolved I tell you by fire and pestilence abroad in the land that kills the deserving, but has spared me as sinners are spared even in the hour of judgment, truth be told, while the righteous who enjoy the thought of heaven are rewarded for their wish. And by reason of promises made to all, including me, I am spared each sunrise and each sunset as I dare inhale the air and test myself that I should so prevail and be relieved of all promises made to man as men of righteousness shall fall and those of sin do not deserve my adherence. But this absolution, even my God denies me as he releases me from him, but not from them. And now one more work remains before the end of days and this is harder still to seek absolution from myself. Not God, nor fire, nor pestilence, nor winter snows that in my dotage chill my breast no matter the layers of my defense and turn my fingertips blue and numb even at height of day will reach that stubborn, deeply buried corner of my judgment wherein I demand adherence to all oaths, abjure all salvations, deny all absolutions, distrust all Valhallas, and even in the warm swarthing of spring, distrust all promises, despise all prophets, reject all wisdom as merely true, but insufficient. Because I demand a person never conceived or conceivable who fulfills all promises he promises his own self. It is spring and hateful green of the grass is mocking me. It avers I am a failure of mind and flesh. I cannot even meet the dreams I dream, lost in odious reveries, enchanted by obvious palliatives, seduced by God, self-served by absolution, untorched by fire and pestilence, left naked before the grass, which I cannot see, as even prophets and truth are now denied. I am not absolved. Thank you. Thank you so much for your reading. Yeah. Next, I have the joy of introducing Ken Lee. Ken Lee is the author of five books of poetry, the latest being Opening the Camp, self-published in 2019 by the Harvard Bookstore. His poetry has appeared in Poetry East, Nimrod, Ibbotson Street, The Lyric, and several others. He is a pathologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital, specializing in gynecological pathology. He lives with his wife, Kathleen, in Boston and Vermont. Opening the camp may be obtained through the bookstore at harvard.com or through Amazon. Ken can be reached at krlee at bwh.harvard.edu. Please welcome Ken. Thank you. Am I on? Um, thank you all uh, for attending and listening. Thank you very much, New England Poetry Club, for the great honor of being able to read before this audience. And also thanks to the other readers. Uh, they were wonderful readings. Um, I'm going to read from our last book, which is Opening the Camp. And the camp refers to our summer camp up in Burlington, Vermont. And it sits on the edge of Lake Champlain and overviews the Adirondack Mountains. So if you buy my book, you get a beautiful picture of that, even if you don't like the poems.
My first poem is called Memoro Ergo Sum. Black snowflakes backlit by the street lamp drift across its yellow megaphone as I stand on the corner of Palmer and Griggs, looking up at them as they disappear and disappear into the blackness around me, age six, late winter of 47. Except that it's summer of 2017 and I on the self annihilating point of the present, trolling in its wake, have hooked a snow filled interlude entered that night by my recorder standing with his notebook beside me. My Boswell with his instinct for the highlights to document my growing apprehension that life was real and I'd been placed inside it. Beleaguered things. That red tailed hawk I saw would qualify stoic high on a bare oak branch while half a dozen wheeling crows peeled off one by one to buzz its head. And the walls of my old grammar school, 300 squirming bodies rising to a boil above the roiling tom-toms of the nuns. Fractions, verb declensions, God has come. He's come, he's come, he's come. There I, age six, received the egg of faith placed by Sister Joseph in my heart, which selected for by those dogmatic drums evolved into a fully feathered hawk that I carried with me from that noisy cloister to a world that fed it contradictions, questions it could not digest. It grew so frail, I didn't even feel it when it fled. Now I sit on my front porch late afternoons and listen for the distant sound of drums. But all I hear are shadows, treetops as they creep across the lawn. I live on Marlboro Street in Boston and I like to sit on the Commonwealth Mall all early in the morning and sip a cup of coffee. So this poem was thought up doing that. It's called Symbiosis. At this early hour, my thermos of coffee, a mile long arcade of elms, flanking a generous aliquot of benches, it starts to dawn. I am the only one without a dog. So I become an anthropologist. I think of hairy plodding men with spears surrounded by their snarling canine spotters. And I note the dogs today are smaller, their owners less ferocious. The former sniff and squat, the latter gather it in plastic doggy bags. Their roles comprise a modern symbiosis. Each species has adapted to survive hard loneliness inside a small apartment. Numbered squares. The rumpled purple pocket calendar he always carried with him was his guide. Each numbered square with scribbled names and places was a little lamp that lit up the inside of the opaque urn from which the future poured. But he didn't feel it fall out from his pocket, bunched with that wad of Kleenex he withdrew. Now it's slouching on a green line subway seat, reminding no one of nothing to the end. gravity waves emitted from all accelerating bodies, but too weak to be detected from anything less massive than colliding black holes. The moment your lips parting announce your kiss, your wrist unfurls your reaching hand, just then at MIT, Professor Weiss puts down the phone. He's won the Nobel Prize for devising a machine that won the race to capture Einstein's waves from deep in space. But he didn't even need those two black holes. If over the bridge, he'd just hopped off the bus, deployed his wavy probe and aimed at us. At the granite quarry, 14 gray haired bucket listers in a mini bus up to the edge, 
where our guide H81, he proudly told us, explained how the granite made mountain in great gray slabs was being disassembled on a ledge across the chasm filled with water by the little men with their toy machines slicing off 20 ton wafers of stone to be hauled down the hill to be cut up and honed in the Rock of Ages headstone factory. A process we later observed from the visitor's balcony. How the slabs wrapped in slings attached to long cables, which hung from the great ceiling gantries, were guided into steel circular saws whose diamond studded teeth bit voraciously, then on to other finer sizings, shapings, scrollings, stenciled letter blastings. As we drove away, we both thought it strange, considering how interesting it was, that the only thing we talked about were the way back to Barry and the beautiful fall day. I like to look at art and uh, this, this is a couple of poems here about art. Clash of the Great Powers. At the sculpture park, our favorite was Noguchi. We circled a great gray knot of twisted stone, stopped and stood at intervals to ponder the infinite replies to light by form. Unlike when we saw the great assumption, Titian's masterpiece set fixed above a grand Venetian altar, forced to view the same magnificence from every angle. of art, of craft, the Eva Hess exhibit at the Metropolitan uh, uh, Museum of Modern Art. Of wool, of rope, of wavy plastic tubes, of simple and of spare and yet so strong. How are they not like a boat in a bottle or a glued and beveled solid walnut table? I read a biography of Robert Oppenheimer and that's uh, inspired this poem. I learned he grew up in New York City and visited New Mexico as a young man and was very taken by the place, overwhelmed. And perhaps that's why the atomic bomb development took place there. The young Oppenheimer visits New Mexico. He strolled along among saguaros under stars Upstage by jealous Broadway lights back home, amazed to learn that heaven's registrars so re zealously recruited for its dome. Then curious, what dynamo, what source, what wondrous agency that it could blow such splendid sparks across the universe. The scorpion and rattlesnake laid low. Then from underneath a canted rock it beamed a cactus flower natives called the torch. Nocturnal, blazing white and rarely seen, it told him he was meant to do research. Go find those seeds of elemental power, water them, observe them as they flower. To a scientist whose work has come to nothing. Summer, 4 a.m. beside the lake, I'm wrapped in a blanket of blackness, a chickadee, pip, 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 a drop of light, and it goes gunmetal gray. Now, sliding into indigo, the lake and sky become a megaphone that amplifies the sudden distant whistle of a train somewhere in the New York hills between them. I reach for my binoculars to scan them, deep green mottled mounds, lights flicking on in houses in the now awakened village of Port Kent. Again, the whistle sounds, two blows this time, but like that hidden chickadee, the train remains unverified. Four more times, a plainted, sourceless, faint diminuendo, gone. This is another sitting by the lake poem called Shades of Gray. After a night of rain, the mountains rest 
on a misty silver line above the lake, the edge of a rippled steel gray mirror of the overlying hemisphere of clouds, a parade of solemn, solemn marching marble troops, each represents their sovereign state of grayness. Ashen, smoky, pearly, leaden, iron, all fringed with filmy evanescent tassels. And here and there perceptible between, a streak of iridescent green, a blush of blue. H-O-R-S-E, 250 pounds of sandbag ballast were not enough to stop the last nor'easter. So we hauled up the fallen driveway hoop and shoveled off the gray disheveled snow. Father, son and grandson pressing spring, eager to test our set shots, jumpers, hooks and driving layups in a game of horse. First, the little guy, he sinks a six foot push Piece of cake, say I, as I fondle the ball, then step to match it, launch a bloody, bloody brick. Over the winter, I've turned into a lobster. My hands are claws. I'm trapped in a bright red shell. The little one laughs, but my son steps back, uncertain what to say or how to act. scavenging my earliest memories. Brown chickens on a lawn beside a barn. White dunes along a shore seen from a car. Grainy, faded edges, hard to hold. They lie beneath the surface at the boundary where agencies sought entrance to awareness. With determined deep sea mining, some come up like bubbles coalescing, rise and burst. A rock rimmed goldfish pond a tiny stucco house beside a well, precipitates from blankness into time. Retirement Dilemma. The bumblebees have grown obese. The geese debate delaying their migration as summer lingers on in mid-October. The garden, Marigold still blooming, confuses the monarch butterflies. If we wait for them to wilt before we go, will we have time to get to Mexico? Two more poems. This one's called Still Going. Summer makes a stand in mid-September by pulling up a Caribbean blanket. It pushes me outside in my pajamas to lean on my porch rail to watch Orion slowly sink behind the Adirondacks. Then as I straighten and turn for the door, I'm greeted by the basic core of me. Not the one I mostly turn back into after gaping at enormity on porches, the needy one who knows how old he is, where he lives, how much beer is in the fridge? Or the one preoccupied by diagnoses, exotic tumors calling for a name? Or the one who keeps on flashing to the past to resurrect long de dead, untaken chances? No, it was the one untouched since its inception by memory, anxiety, or age. The one that first congealed when I was three, who comes unbidden intermittently to bring me the good news that he's still going. This is my last poem called Moot. What's the most important choice in life? Luckily, I never had to make it. When we met each other's eyes at your front door, just then it seemed our status as old friends dissolved with my ability to choose. Confirmed with our first tentative embrace, when your fingers pressed my back and pulled me closer, all subsequent decisions became moot. Thank you. 
Yay, Grandpa! <laughs> yes. Well, let's yeah, let's all in. <laughs> oh, awesome. So yes, so let's all unmute to give each of our wonderful poets who gave us the gift of their time this afternoon to share their poems. You know, <laughs> a round of applause. <laughs> Question time. I would like to ask a question. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, where you go? I, I wanted to talk to Stephen. He's still there? Yes. Yes. Uh, hi there. Uh, I was very, very, very impressed with, with your readings. Uh, and uh, my question to you is the uh, poems uh, that you we talk about killing, 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 killing you know, all these people. And then also the other one where you're naming all these uh, great people that you think of or came in contact with, like, you know, Leonard Bernstein and so forth. Are those in the same book? Uh, uh, all, of, all of these poems that I read uh, will be in my uh, next uh, collection, which uh, I'm which I'm assembling. <laughs> Does it have a title yet so I can look for it? Uh, no, but uh, I... Uh, All right, then I'll wait. I, then. I, I, I can make one up, but uh, I don't have one. <laughs> it's okay. Right. Thank we'll you. Wait till you, you announce it. Okay. Thank, Thank you so you. much. We can put it in the newsletter when it comes out, Steve. I, I thought Killer was very powerful as well. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions or comments? I have a, a question for all our readers. Thank you very much to, to each of you. And um, I was struck by uh, the musicality really in, in all your works. And it seemed just in li on listening that um, Howie and Steve you used a lot of anaphora or repetition of the first few words in a poem and that drove a lot of your poems. And Ken, in your in your work, I heard a, I heard a lot of meter and verse, and uh, and meter and rhyme rather. And um, um, I just wondered if you could each kind of comment on on uh, your attraction to different uh, devices in poetry, and if that's changed, you know, over the years in 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 your writing, and what's kind of driving your work now. Well, I'm always trying to find music. That's very important to me, the sounds, whether it's assonance or consonance. And anaphora is a, is a wonderful uh, way of, of getting a poem going, the repetition. So uh, I'm, I'm very much into using those kinds of things. I, I started out really being uh, uh, forcibly imbued with uh, 19th century uh, uh, story poems uh, with uh, rhyme and meter. Uh, and what I liked about those and still like about those is that they have a, uh, they have a uh, drive. The pace of the poem and the choice of words drives forward uh, to uh, a, a point or an emotion at the end. And uh, that I think translates seamlessly into uh, poems which are unrhymed and unmetered, uh, and a lot of the repetition in my work uh, is to create uh, the punch and the drive uh, to get you to uh, uh, to get me to the end point I want to be at, and hopefully convey that end point. Um, can I say? Please, yes. Um, yeah, you know, I was my first attraction to poetry rather late in life was Shelley. And I read through all the romantic poets at that time and uh, loved them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first poems I started to write seriously were rhyming poems. The poem about Oppenheimer is a sonnet with rhyme throughout. And I gradually, I, I just figured I couldn't be a real poet in free verse if I didn't be, wasn't able to rhyme first. You know? <laughs> so I started with rhyming and, and then got into free, free verse, I guess you would call it. But I still like to say in my head, the meter and uh, it's sort of a, 
idiosyncratic <laughs> iambic pentameter with in, inside rhymes and that sort of thing that I, that's the way I write. Ken, I don't know if you're aware of it, but uh, uh, Mr. Oppenheimer was a great, great fan of poetry. And uh, all the time he was working on the atomic bomb, uh, his, many of his nights were spent reading and uh, devising poetry just to get away from uh, uh, the, the main topic of his visit there. But he was very much into poetry also. <laughs> That's really interesting. I don't remember that from reading it, but it was a long time ago that I read that book. Other responses or questions or also notes of praise? <laughs> I was going to say to Ken that I um, I kind of I related to the symbiosis poem, um, your image of the cavemen with the their dogs when you're when you're looking at people in um, in the park with their dogs in modern day. It, that's that's the kind of place my head goes sometimes. <laughs> so I just I just related to it. <laughs> I have to admit, Tom Daly gave me that hint because that wasn't in the poem originally, and he oh, was a mentor of mine. Yeah. Interesting. I really enjoyed um, Stephen's apple poem. I think that was fresh and really, really beautiful on such a beautiful afternoon. So thank you for that one. Thank you. I'll, I'll add in that I, well, I um, of all the poems I appreciated by everyone, all three of you reading, I will say that Howie's eight minutes and 46 seconds poem is mm. the one of the most distinct approaches to this very, well, you, you can't overstate it, but painful and, and, and crushing situation that, that we, we live with. Um, so I really want to call that out. Thanks. And, and one of the joys that we have as poets, of course, is when we go to readings and find affinities, you know, un, affinities among the three poets. So for instance, I'm a perpetual note taker at readings with all three poets. They were so in, you know, engaged in the world of nature, you know, whether it's nature's creatures or the landscape that I found very fascinating. All three poets included a love poem whether directly stated or indirectly. So that means that, again, that resonated with me as well too. So thank you for the gift of that this afternoon. Thank you. I have a question for the uh, folks who were kind enough to uh, put together the program. Uh, I think that all three poets are fundamentally of the same age. I don't know whether that was an accident or an experiment or uh, Someone want to address that or simply shut me <laughs> off? I don't know. <laughs> sure, sure. I was struck by that too. It was really by random um, people who have new books, you know, who are members, uh, right? And and we fill the slots as people uh, ask for them. And it, I was thinking, you know, in in some ways we had more homogeneity in, in certain ways than we usually do, but it was definitely not a not a curated reading in that sense. For the old men. If it'll help your theory at all, Stephen, uh, I'm 89 years old and I just started writing poetry three years ago. You were you were just become my hero. I, you're, um, I'm gonna add you to the person I wanna be when I have to change my persona. No, no, we're all us oldie goldies. We know what to do. <laughs> uh, this is Ken's daughter uh, out in Seattle. Thanks oh. for your reading. Hey, Maria. Hi. We just got a puppy, and I want to say every time I pick up poop, I think of your poem, Symbiosis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, honey. <laughs> I'm going to defer to my um, more experienced colleagues, uh, um, board board of uh, board members from the Poetry Club. So, shall we transition to the open mic?
fine. Great. <laughs> so well, thank you again for um for coming. And I look forward to listening to to the voices as Linda is gonna be curate, curating or organizing that part of the event. See Charlie Charlie's uh... <laughs> And thank you, Maria Luisa, for, for doing such a beautiful job hosting. Mm -hmm. Wonderful to have it's My that. joy. It's my joy. <laughs> um, so to start off the open mic, we have first on the list, Kate Cairns. Are you ready, Kate? Yeah. Hi. Great. Hi. Okay. I'm a new to your membership, so it's cool to be here. I've been going to so many readings now that I can go to them at home. Um, so I'm up in Scarborough, Maine, and this is a relatively new poem called Dear After. Someday soon or not soon, for one of us, then the other, this poem will become an elegy. No telling where we'll go when we're gone. The resurrection fern, down curled and drought crisp, waits dry, in a gray between, then when water steeps it again, revives to evergreen. In limbo, it thrives, patient, like the wood frog whose awful body freezes solid in winter, its blood a tangled icicle. Though heart and brain clink like crystal and stop their vital work, livingness somewhere inside lives. Thaws with the brook silt and starts back up. It goes on just like that. And water fills the dirt brown fern to green. A frond of warmth, the long fact of it holds like a body's imprint in its bed. Dear after, I don't know what to ask for. I don't know where this correspondence goes. Remember it's possible to feel this, this. It's possible for atoms to disperse as they will by all evidence scattered, and wake home. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Beautiful. Next, we have Mike Ball. Yeah, uh, I have a poem. But before I do that, I would like to have a, a brief haiku just for the season and the election. Jubilate for Joe, not just for Joe, but all of us, time for Thanksgiving. All right. So then, um, repeated delights. I looked away and you changed. How long ago did I absent myself? Two years or was it three? Yet, your body at least is again in the tall, wide living room, in your stuffed cotton duck floral chair. Your grace induces grace from me. And we instantly fall into sharing your repeated delight of discovery. Do you have grandchildren? Oh, one of each, how wonderful. Do you have photos of them on your phone? How lovely, which son is their father? Many images of wee round faces are evidence certain, but only for that moment, phone photos at last resolve nothing. Slowly spinning on the carousel of chit and chat in the living room, the playground of our civility, with each circuit comes a pause, and then with each pause, an erasure. Do you have any grandchildren? Two, how lovely. Do I look away ever again? And what to if I fail to visit? Do I have any power here with you? Yes. I know I turned away, and when I looked again, you were not gone, but changed. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Our next reader is Chris O'Carroll. Thank you, Linda. Uh, my grandchildren think that my poems are okay, but they really love Robert Louis Stevenson's A Child's Garden of Verses. So this child's eye view of the pandemic owes a little something to Stevenson's My Shadow. This is A Child's Garden of Virus. I know a little virus that keeps chasing after me, a white ball with red bristles, which is much too small to see. 
It tries to get inside my lungs, to give me a disease that I can pass to you and you with every cough or sneeze. When viruses attack us, they can swiftly multiply. If we are careless, we might help them build up their supply. A proper child must wear protection everywhere he goes, a mask across the face to cover up the mouth and nose. The virus might be lurking every place my fingers stray, so now I wash my hands about a million times a day. Mom sprays and wipes our doorknobs, disinfects our telephones, and warns me that the beaches and the parks are danger zones. I can't go to the library, the movies, or the zoo. This boring little virus says there's nothing safe to do. The funniest thing about the virus is its sunny side. I stay home from the funerals of relatives who died. Thank you. Well, that's a timely warning. <laughs> Thank you. Next, Richard Brenneman. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this poem is going to be published in Constellations uh, this year. Not standard issue. I am not standard issue, carbon copy, mass produced, off the shelf, ready to wear, or a stereotype of my demographic. Authentic, odd, eccentric, yet carried along in the zeitgeist swirl, interlocked in the framework of the day-to-day. -day. I scrape along, seen by some as a hanger-on, others a clown. Not I, though I had sought to amuse, to survive, to hide out riding on carousels behind masks. Yet I can do no more than stand aside and turn from the fray and turn to meet their likewise demon haunted hearts that beat beneath clown faces, civilians that resemble standard issue who also hide behind masks, both together or apart. We interweave and dance back and forth in this carnival of life. Thank you. Thank you. We're all individuals here, eh? Um, next is Paul Smith. <clears throat> okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, the poem that I have here, uh, originally I wrote in three stanzas, but uh, by coming to this particular uh, uh, New England Poet Club, I happened to meet and listen to uh, a poet, uh, poet, poet by the name of John Goslowski. Uh, and it was through reading his book that I was able to think harder and come up with a fourth stanza. My poem is about a memorial to all the Holocaust memorials. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the word Holocaust and what it implies and infers and actually means. <clears throat> Why do we need Holocaust memorials? What is there to see? Pictures of Jews in piles, some old, some young, some in the prime of their life, like prime rib waiting to be roasted. By the way, do you ever see a German laughing? No, tradition is you only laugh in beer gardens. There are no beer gardens in Auschwitz. Do you need to see an oven? Well, be nice now. It's a crematorium. Be sure to clean out the ashes, sprinkle them on the ground, and when the grass grows, be sure to thank your ancestors and mom and dad too. Oh, and let's not forget the bunk beds in the multi-guest barracks. They must be labeled for Jews only, short, medium, skinny, and emaciated too. For those of you into X-rated shows, take a peek, take a look. Are there enough naked women to sate all your desires? Do you see any breasts that will light your fires? No, we don't really need a memorial. All we really need is a boxcar marked dogs not allowed. Then put it in the front yard with a really big sign, painted red, you know, 
the memorial colors for the dead and simply say, do not look inside for a Holocaust fans only. Now, if only we were Polish and Catholic and priests to boot, we would have been sent to Camp Buchenwald, a much nicer spot to summer in. No crematoriums to speak of, but we could work till exhaustion, eat bugs, dead animals, and soup du jour rainwater. Wake up at dawn, work till dusk, and we could pay them with our family treasures. All this and a chance to be shot in the head. So don't look there, it's for Holocaust fans only. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have David Miller. <clears throat> Hello everybody. Um, thank you all for being here and, and of course all was for I think all our, uh, us open micers always appreciate everyone who who manages to be able to stay stay right through. So I discovered a little while back uh, something that perhaps everybody else knew, but the Merriam-Webster online site uh, it, on that site you can search for uh, on a given year and discover for out of their gargantuan database uh, the words that first appeared in print in English in that year. So I did, I searched on my birth year and we have the new words of 1955. I made the scene that year, a non-fossil, non-computer, dieseling my new lungs, jazzed and mind boggling. As Miriam Webster spins out the new vocab zingers that va voomed with me into Eisenhower time, I now pinball some liner notes from Litter Bag America. Empty calories off-gassed from the idiot box. Weirdos retargeted artificial intelligence into DYI speakerphones. Home computers? Sheesh, just a big bang theory of juiced up motor mouths. Skydiving nymphets spun the bottle like gangbusters. Sovietologists practiced self-contamination with Einsteinium at Zydeco keggers. In muscle shirts, the new left stir-fried Peking duck, then cornerbacked ICBMs with fabric softener. Did hidden agendas micro-miniaturize punch lists? Majorly. Ultra-physical megatonnage put a suicide squeeze on information science. Exurbanites with split ends scarfed soft serve paninis on military time. Although aerospace dune buggied its data files to agribusiness, microwave ovens were counterintuitive to me. My parents' survivable electrojet flatmate, post impact, post impact mud bug in a yin yang booster seat, their non automated unignorable stress test. And you, Miriam Webster, time reversal cosmonaut, thanks for the wetsuit box cutters, non-leaded veggies, the free agent red pandas of platform tennis. Thank you. Thank you, David, for taking us back in time. <laughs> and finally, our own darling, Hilary Salek. Yay. Hi, everyone. So I just have a, a very short poem. Poem. Now and then it floated, half submerged, a log I thought at first, but no, it glided deeper. And there it was again, at ease on the rippling murk, with a tail floating behind it, a sleek fur pelt, then under again. Once I found it right beside me on the bank. There you are, I said softly. And off it went back in. I saw bubbles in its wake. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So that concludes our open mic and also our event for this afternoon. Thank you again for the gift of your time. 
you know, it's a joy to, again, to hear all the poets today. And we do welcome you back in December. So let me just recheck the date. Oh, actually put the light on. Um, well, December 13th, again, our readers will be Glenn Curry, Maura Linehan, and Jose Edmundo Reyes. So thank you again. Have a wonderful day. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs> you all. Am I going to do breakout rooms? Oh, are we going to do breakout rooms? Oh. <laughs> um, my bad. I, I'm my first time hosting, my bad.